standing if you're able in reverence for God's word and then be seated after Emily has finished. All right, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. All right. I'm not going to say anything to embarrass you, Emily. I thought about it, but I do appreciate you. <clears throat> Today, we're diving in. We're, we're starting a new series on 1 Corinthians. Um, and so this morning, I hope to quickly accomplish three things. I want to give you a little bit of background on the letter that will help you to wrap your mind around it. Um, I, I want to give you a reason for why we're covering 1 Corinthians in particular. I mean, if we're going to go through a book of the Bible, there's 66 of those. You could have picked any of them. Why do we pick 1 Corinthians? And then <clears throat> I want to walk us through the opening of this letter, which Emily just read for us. And so I would strongly encourage you to have... Uh, your Bibles and journals for this series. I'm going to do my best to walk through the letter in an orderly way, but I won't as I work through it, even within a message. I won't always reread every verse. And so it would be best if you have it in front of you so you can kind of see if I'm if I'm skipping through the passage for, for today or another day, uh, it would be best if you have it in front of you to see, oh, that's where he's, where he's drawing that from. Um, so yeah, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 1. I'd invite you to open there. <clears throat> let's dive in. Actually, let's dive in. Let me say a quick word of prayer. Dear God, I pray that you would meet us here in 1 Corinthians. Lord, open our hearts to why there is value in this ancient text in our lives today. Would you speak through your word? Whether it be words that, that I say or whether it be words that I do not say but you, Spirit, whisper into our hearts. Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so first, let me, let me first answer a, a potential objection to diving into background information, because I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, on this. So the, the objection could be, well, why does background information matter? Can't we just read the Bible, open it up, and, and do what it says? And to that, I'd say, well, not exactly. I think it's more complicated than that. And then some people would say, well, well, but isn't it God's word? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, it is God's word. Uh, but, but, it's, but it's God's word in that God inspired its writing and, and that he superintended the writing. And, but it's not a literal transcript of, of words that God spoke. The letter of 1 Corinthians, it's Paul's words, uh, which were written according to the Spirit's inspiration to accomplish God's purposes. Okay? And so, yes, it's God's word, but it's also Paul's word. And so in, in order to correctly understand it, we need to know a little bit about Paul. Uh, <clears throat> also, it wasn't written in English. Okay? So unless you're, you're reading in the original uh, Greek, which you're probably not, at least I'm not, um, what you're actually reading, you know, I'm reading, I tend to teach through the ESV translation. There's many translations of the Bible. Uh, but whatever you're reading, it is in and of itself. A, an interpretation of what's going on because you're having to make decisions on how do we translate this word or this phrase or what's, what's, what's Paul trying to communicate here. Also, I'll just point out that 1 Corinthians or really any of the things in the Bible, they weren't written first to you or to me. Uh, it was written first and foremost to the original audience. And so for us, for 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the original audience was the Christians at the ancient city of Corinth. And so we need to know a little bit about them. 
And so for all those reasons, and honestly for more reasons I don't have time for, you can't just read the Bible and do what it says. There's more to it than that. You need to dive into it and kind of pull it apart and see what's going on there. And so let's dive in and let's ask some introductory questions about this book of the Bible. Okay, so first and foremost, what is 1 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians as it probably says literally in your Bible? Uh, it's, it's a letter uh, written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church at Corinth. Corinth. And so let me explain. So Paul, along with Silas, uh, there's a map here. I know it's small, but it, it'll be all right. There's be a, another map here in just a second. This is Paul's second missionary journey. And so Paul, along with another uh, Christian named Silas, they set out on a missionary journey. And first they revisited some cities where Paul and his companions had planted churches on their first missionary journey. Okay, it's kind of that beginning part, that part uh, where it goes through the, the southern part of modern, modern day Turkey. Um, then, if you can read all about this in Acts, Acts 16, they, they keep going. They want to preach the gospel, and the Spirit just kind of gives them a hard no. And they end up walking all the way across Turkey, just not really stopping to, to preach, just kind of keep moving. Um, <clears throat> they keep going, and, and they, they cross over. They go into Greece, modern-day Greece, uh, and eventually they end up in a very unique city, uh, Corinth. Okay, And so let's talk about Roman Corinth. Here's a picture. I'll go back to that one. Here's a picture of the ruins, maybe, maybe they'll come back, uh, the, of the ruins of, of ancient Greek Corinth. Um, this picture is just a it's, a, it's actually a painting, but uh, it kind of shows the city from uh, up above. And so in Corinth, there was, it was a city that was kind of down by the, uh, well, I'll show you a map here in a second where, where, it, where it actually is situated, but it's situated by the water. It's a port city, okay, so you can see the water in this painting. Uh, there's also uh, an Acropolis behind it. An Acropolis is kind of a, a small but tall high mountain that shoots up right behind Corinth. And so this painting is looking down at some Romans from, looks like halfway up the Acropolis, looking down over the city toward, toward the, the sea there. It's kind of a, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting picture to make our background. Uh, anyhow, let me tell you a little bit about Corinth. Corinth is an ancient Greek city. Uh, it was densely populated by the 10th century B.C., like a thousand years before Jesus. And due to its location, more on that in a second, it was both important and it was a target. Okay, so Greek Corinth was kind of built, destroyed, went through a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of turmoil. Ultimately, it was destroyed by the Romans as they were conquering southern Greece, the region called Achaia. Uh, and it was deserted for about a century. Okay. And then in uh, 44 B.C., Julius Caesar, yes, that Julius Caesar, uh, he had the, them start rebuilding the city in his own honor, and it was resettled by the Romans. So why was Corinth important? Well, this image is going to show you. <clears throat> you know the phrase in real estate, location, location, location? That's, that's why Corinth was important. It's very simple. Uh, so you, if you can kind of see, uh, Corinth is down on like the bottom left. You can see Achaia. It's down there. You can see how the Greek mainland, it pinches down real tight, and then it goes out on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Corinth sits right at that pinch point, uh, right on that little isthmus. Um, and it, so it, it connected Greece uh, north and south. And so it sat at the pinch point of north-south trade routes in ancient Greece. So that made it important for land uh, trade, but also there's ports on both sides of the sea. You can kind of see how it kind of goes in uh, close to Corinth there. Uh, there's a port on both sides there. And that became, those two seaports became the main kind of through pass for the Roman Empire that when they were doing uh, east-west trade. Okay, so if they were trading from, you know, all the way over in the east, uh, you know, Palestine, uh, Israel, that kind of vicinity, all the way from there over to Rome or even farther to the west, those, that trade, those goods would have passed through Corinth. It was much more dangerous to sail around the Peloponnesian Peninsula than it was to actually stop at Corinth. And so they had a dry canal. Sometimes they would actually, even on this dry canal, they would use carts, and if the boat was small enough, they would just lift the boat up out of the water and drag it across a couple miles and then put it back in the water on the other side, the other port. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, was, it, was an important, uh, it was important for both north-south and east-west trade routes, and therefore Corinth was perfectly situated to charge taxes and tariffs. That's why Corinth was important. 
And so as such, the city flourished. And so why was Corinth important to the Romans? Because it was a wealthy trade hub, and therefore it was the Roman administrative hub of its region. Additionally, this is just kind of interesting, I think, uh, but the wealth in Corinth led one commentator to say that Corinth was arguably the most dazzling and modern of Greek cities. Okay, I just think that's interesting. Not only that, but many citizens of Corinth were so wealthy because of this trade and just kind of where it sat, uh, that, that wealth and ostentatious display became the hallmark of Corinth. And, and now that's not to say that everyone was wealthy. There was great wealth disparity. We're actually going to see that show up as we work our way through this letter and, and what, what that causes. Uh, it causes problems in the church. So that's, but that's why Corinth was important for the Romans. The second reason Corinth was important was because it proved to be a profitable place for gospel ministry. Let's just talk about that. Because Corinth was a trade hub, because people were always passing through the city, the city was known for having a cosmopolitan, diverse feel. It was a place where many religions flourished, and there was a spirit of anything goes. And so let me give you a little, a couple of examples here. So there was actually, there was a major temple that sat atop the Acropolis. That temple was to Aphrodite, uh, the, the, the goddess of love and fertility. Uh, she was considered the protectress of the city. And so that one was pretty important. But there was also a temple to Apollo. Uh, there was a, a temple to the Roman emperor cult. I believe it was to Octavia. Uh, there was a, a temple to the god of healing, Asclepius. And so some people actually came to Corinth hoping for miraculous healings. Kind of an interesting side note. Uh, <clears throat> plus there were various other small temples and shrines to other Roman gods. Not to mention, on top of all of that, in Corinth there was also a Jewish synagogue. And so I say all of that to say this. Uh, some of the cities you read about in the New Testament, they're, they're, they're kind of closed off. They're very kind of one thing centric. Corinth, uh, in Corinth, there was a spirit of significant religious tolerance present. And all of that gave Paul and his companions the opportunity to share the gospel. Lots of people in Corinth were saying lots of things uh, all the time in Corinth. And so someone new comes in sharing something new. People are like, oh, let's give this a listen. And then if they don't like it, they move on. So that's an important reason for why Corinth was important for us. The third reason Corinth is, was important uh, for our purposes is because it was the home to some culturally significant things. I already mentioned its wealth. It was a unique city in that regard. We'll see that pop up later in our study. They hosted the biannual uh, Isthmian Games. If you've heard of the ancient Olympic Games, this is kind of like the, the, the junior version of that. Uh, we'll get into that in later weeks. But the cultural reality that's really going to matter for us is the city's reputation for immorality. Okay? Greek Corinth was known to be a sexually perverse place. And there were, uh, some say, that at least during the Greek times, there were up to a thousand prostitutes at that temple of Aphrodite at a time. Which is kind of crazy. We don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they say. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the Athenians, so Athens, the Athenians, they considered the Corinthians so especially degraded that when they did plays, they had a stock figure in their play that would just show up repeatedly uh, of, of a person wearing uh, a Corinthian hat, and that person would just play the drunk. Um, that's Corinth. That's the, that's the perception of Corinth. Now, Roman Corinth was slightly better, but still, think about it. It's a port city built on people passing through, uh, especially it, it's a city that has many temples that offer the opportunity to worship through prostitution. All of that kind of bundles together to lead to the continued perception of Corinth as a particularly immoral city, even by Roman standards. And the reality is those things are going to show up in our study. Okay, so that's all background information. Those are things we're going to work through in the coming Weeks. So why are we studying this letter, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth? Let me give you some words here. Maybe this will help you to, to kind of hone in on why we're doing this. Corinth was a prideful, wealthy, tolerant, immoral city, and the church of Corinth ended up being all of these things. Uh, it, it, they ended up being prideful, wealthy, and therefore prone to greed, overly tolerant, immoral, and more. They were divisive people. We're going to cover that next week. 
And so that list of attributes, think about that list. Prideful, wealthy, overly tolerant, immoral, divisive. I think that sounds a lot like the context that we all currently live in, the cultural air that we breathe in America. And so therefore, many of the problems that the Corinthian church was facing turn out to be many of the same problems that the church in America, and even right here where we're at, face. And so this letter and the issues that it highlights, I think, are incredibly relatable to us. And that's really the main reason I wanted to dive into it. Now, before diving into the text of 1 Corinthians 1, let me briefly talk about the occasion for which this letter was sent. Uh, all of the epistles or letters in the New Testament uh, that became books of the New Testament, they were written for a purpose. They were written for an occasion. And so what was the occasion of 1 Corinthians? Well, Paul had spent about 18 months in Corinth on that missionary journey, planting and establishing the church there. Then he spends a, about three years, almost three years, in Ephesus. And while he's there, uh, this is Ephesus is kind of western Turkey, and so trade can kind of flow back and forth between those cities pretty easily, and so word of how the church is going can flow back and forth between those two cities. While he's there, he writes to the church at Corinth regarding some issues that he's heard about. Specifically, it dealt with sexual immorality in the church. Okay? However... That letter, Paul's first letter, which we don't have, by the way, we don't have, have record of it, uh, it was misunderstood. And so rather than encouraging the Corinthians to deal with their problems, uh, it highlighted divisions in the church, it highlighted rampant sexual immorality, and it highlighted social snobbery, not to mention a whole host of other confusions that needed to be dealt with. And so therefore, Paul decided, okay, I'm going to write you guys another letter. I'm going to write you guys a longer letter. And so if you know 1 Corinthians, you know it's actually one of the longest letters in the New, New Testament. And in it, uh, we're going to see Paul deal with all those characteristics I already mentioned, plus he's going to have to deal with their arrogance and their self-centeredness, and he's going to have to deal with their lack of understanding of the holiness that God requires of his people. There's a lot, which kind of begins to explain why 1 Corinthians is so long. <clears throat> now, those things are not good things to find in the church, right? And so Paul addresses them. So, I've been making this kind of long case, talking through the background. So, at last, let's turn to our text and see how Paul greets this church that is prideful, greedy, overly tolerant, immoral, divisive, arrogant, self-centered, and does not understand God's call to holiness. How do we think he's going to greet them? Let's dive in and read it again. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 9. The greeting, first few verses. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks, this is the next section here, thanksgiving, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I just spent five to ten minutes telling you who the people of Corinth are, kind of the things they deal with, the, 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 what the church is known for. And then we read that. Anybody find that introduction maybe a little disorienting, maybe even a little, like, overly positive? Like, that's, when I read it, I'm like, whoa, that's... That's kind of, that's not what I expect. You almost expect, like Corinth, the, this letter to the, the Corinth church, to just like start off by dropping the hammer. And he doesn't. Paul starts with a positive greeting and a, and a good thanksgiving. And so we're going to talk about that. First, let's look, let's look at a couple things in the greeting, verses 1 through 3. In verse 1, Paul calls himself an apostle. Now, if you don't know that word, apostle here emphasizes that Paul's authority 
is equal uh, of the 12 apostles chosen by Christ. These apostles were specifically called by Christ and they had seen the risen Lord Jesus. Okay, Paul's story is different from the 12 disciples, but, but he's still an apostle. And so these, uh, they established, these apostles, they established and governed the whole church under Jesus Christ. And they had the authority to speak and write words of God equal in authority to the Old Testament scriptures. So that verse one starts there. It's a pretty strong claim to Paul's authority. He's like, everything that comes after what I'm going to write comes out of this reality. That God's made me an apostle. And Jesus made me an apostle. So then Paul calls those messed up Corinthians, that messed up Corinthian church, he calls the people in it sanctified, and he calls them saints. Now those two words, they come from the same Greek word. They mean essentially the same thing. Uh, and those words mean holy. Those words mean set apart. Um, and so Paul, in effect, is saying, you, broken, messed up, foolish, deceived Corinthians, God has chosen you. He has set you apart for his own purposes, and he's not done with you. No matter how, th how dark things get after this point, no matter what he has to address, this is what he's starting with. And he needs them to know, and I need you to know, <laughs> that if you're in Christ, God has chosen you. And despite your shortcomings, you are still his special possession. That's a status that will not be taken away. That's for them. That's for us. Now, should that set-apart status mean that you look set-apart, that your life maybe looks a little different? Yes, it should. I mean, that's literally what Paul says next. He says that they're called those sanctified uh, let me, let me look at it here. Those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints uh, together with all those. Like he literally says, you're sanctified. You've been sanctified. But he also says, you're called to be saints. And so Paul's going to deal with that. But here, it's significant that we notice that they're still considered holy and set apart. God's not done with them yet. And so neither is Paul. I think that's good. <laughs> Before moving on to his Thanksgiving prayer, Paul also, I want to point out that Paul also points out that they are called to be saints Together with all those in every place, who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And if you uh, listened as I read it or you listened as Emily read it, you might have heard those words a lot and been like, geez, he's repeating Lord and Christ, Lord Jesus Christ a lot. Well, two comments here. One, he says that they are saints with all those everywhere and just reminding them this isn't just you and God. This isn't even just your church and God. Like, you're a part of something big. You're a part of something huge. Don't forget that. That's important. That was important for them. That's important for us. But who do they call upon? They call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of a redundant statement. Paul calls Jesus the Lord, as in like the king. And then he also calls him the Christ which is a title that infers to his special anointed leadership. He's specially chosen by God for a special purpose. And so why this redundant reminder? It's almost like he's, he's saying you've been called, uh, who in every place call upon King Jesus King <laughs> or, or, or a special Jesus leader. Like it's, it's, it's a redundant thing. And so why does he do this? Well, I think one, it's simple. Uh, it, it's a reminder that Jesus is the king. Not you, not me, not them, not my desires, not your desires, not anything else. Jesus is king. And I want to point this out. There is no gospel of Jesus apart from the understanding that Jesus was and is king. And that he is to be, if you're a Christian, he is to be your king. And so before you think I'm making a big deal about nothing, I mean, again, I already kind of pointed this out, but, but even in just these first nine verses in the ESV, Paul says the word Lord six times. He says the word Christ nine times. I think maybe he's trying to make a point there, right? In a world where they don't have punctuation, they don't have underline, they don't have boldface, they don't have, all, like, all, every, every word is kind of the same. You, you make a point by repeating yourself. So he's being really repetitive. My point is this. Many of the Corinthians' problems, or the Corinthian Christians' problems, could have been solved, I think, by taking that one little phrase seriously. Lord Jesus Christ. 
all the pride, arrogance, self-centered, divisiveness, mistreatment of others, and all the rest that they were known for. It's incompatible with a life of holy obedience to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Now, let's move on to Paul's prayer of thanksgiving, verses 4 through 9. In it, he gives them a window into what he prays for them. I think this is beautiful. He thanks God for what God has done in them. He's gifted them with special graces, special graces graces of speech, of knowledge, and spiritual gifts. Now, can those special graces be misused? Yeah, they can. And, and, And that's quite often the reality is that our best attributes and our gifts are the things that get us into the most trouble. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I certainly have. Uh, That's a major reason why this letter was written. Their special graces, the things that he's going to, that he's pointing out, he says, God has gifted you in these ways, those things become problematic. And yet here, he's affirming those things. Here he's saying, let's not lose sight of the fact that those are special and that those are good and that those are God's gifts. So we're going to see those things play out. Lastly, in verse 8, Paul affirms that Jesus will sustain these broken believers to the end. He says that he'll sustain them uh, guiltless in the day of Christ. Why? Why will they be sustained? Why will they be called guiltless? Because God is faithful. Not because they were going to get their act together. And do better and be more faithful. No, because God is faithful, merciful, compassionate, and loving. And he carries us to the end. Amen? That's good. It doesn't rely, this whole Christian thing being carried to the end, it doesn't rely on us being perfect or good enough. We're not going to be. God is gracious. God is good. God is merciful. God is loving. He is long-suffering. He's compassionate. And just like we're going to deal with a lot of issues that they dealt with in Corinth, we've got issues. And God is merciful, and he's going to carry us to the end. Don't miss that. So what can we take from these first few verses from this letter to the broken people in the broken church in the broken city of Corinth? Well, for one thing, if you're like me, you know, you're a, maybe you're your own harshest critic. And those words that I mentioned that describe the Corinthian church, I mentioned prideful, overly tolerant, immoral, divisive, arrogant, self-centered, not understanding God's holiness. I mentioned some others. I want you to understand a couple things. One is, yeah, you are called to holiness. And if any of those words describe you, like, again, if you're your own harshest critic, you hear that word and you're like, oh, I don't like that word. I feel like that describes me. If those describe you, yeah, on the one hand, that is a problem. But pride, arrogance, self-centeredness, divisiveness, mis- being someone who mistreats others and the like, those are, in fact, incompatible with a life of holy obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Living in those ways will steal your joy and it will quench the Holy Spirit's influence in your life. And so we're going to look at some of those things in the coming weeks. That's true. But also, like Paul says to the Corinthians, you can still know that you are seen as holy, sanctified saints. Why? Because when God looks at his children, the first thing he sees is Christ in them. Does that mean that he's done with the sanctification process? No way. He's going to keep forming you into the image of the Son. But if you are, if you are, but you are still God's special possession, and that won't be taken away from you. So you don't have to follow God in fear. But instead, you can follow him from a place of stable love, knowing that when God looks at you, he says, that's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. Do they have problems? Yeah, they do. Are we going to work through them? Yeah, we are. (laughs) But that's still my child. That is my special one. That is my beloved. The other thing I hope you'll leave here from these first few verses with is a reaffirmation that Jesus is king. And that if you are going to be a Christ follower, that means he must be your king. Not your desires, not your appetites, not your feelings, or even your special gifts. Again, there's no gospel apart from the understanding that Jesus was and is king, and that he is to be your king. So many of our problems come when we try to steal the throne from Jesus, to give it to our own wants, desires, and feelings. 
If you were here way back when we did our first catechism question, we did number seven today. So if you were here when we did our first one, you might remember, you might remember it. It was this. The question is, what is our only hope in life and death? And the answer, the shortened, the kid's version of the answer, the version I know, is that we are not our own, but belong to God. That is our only hope in life and death. That phrase comes from a verse that, that's going to show up later in 1 Corinthians. And th that verse is an idea that we're going to continue bumping up against. So I'm going to go ahead and read that for you. It's, it's, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So if you are a Christian, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. What was that price? The body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so it's only natural and right to glorify God with that which he has purchased with his son's blood. And that's a theme that I think runs so counter to the culture of the Corinthian church it butts up against them all the time, and it does to us as well. It does so now more than ever. This idea that our only hope in life and death is that we are not our own, but belong to God. So we're going to close out our time with a couple of response questions. The first one is real simple. What do you think, maybe you know the letter of 1 Corinthians a little bit, what do you think you might have to learn from our study of 1 Corinthians? Maybe you don't know 1 Corinthians that well. Maybe all you know is, is kind of what we talked through this morning, uh, these adjectives I used to describe it. What do you think that we might, you might have to learn? Is there anything, maybe if you know the letters, is there anything you're looking forward to or topics you're hoping we do discuss or don't discuss? Or is there anything you're afraid of in 1 Corinthians? Regardless, I'm going to give you a minute to reflect on just 1 Corinthians as a whole. And if there's anything in particular you're thinking about when you think of 1 Corinthians, I would invite you, uh, if you're taking notes, to write that down. And you know, if you have something that you're like, man, I kind of want to talk about that, I would invite you to go ahead and reach out. I'd love to hear that. But I'm going to give you 30 seconds to, to respond to that one.
you belong to yourself and your own wants and desires? Do you belong to a significant other, first and foremost? Do you belong to a job or to a title? Is that your, is that your king? Do you belong to a bank account or to your kids' activities or to any number of other things? The reality is a lot of times the most dangerous idols, false gods, are good things that we make into ultimate things. And so who owns you? Who controls your schedule, your wallet, your life? Remember, the New City Catechism says that our only hope in life and death is that they're not our own, they belong to God. Take 30 seconds to think about something. So if you'd like to think and talk more, you can always reach out to me. Again, I mentioned the communication cards earlier. You can reach out that way. Um, you can also just email me. My email is uh, gooch at L-O-O-C-H at ridgechurchwd.com. If I can reach out. Uh, let me invite you at this point to stand for our benediction, for fi our final word. I'm going to offer you the ver verses 2 and 3 of 1 Corinthians 1, slightly modified. You'll see the modification here. Here we go. To Ridgeview Church, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Jesus, meet us here in this place. Meet us here in this word. May these words be true. May we know that on the one hand, we, you, you, you call us sanctified and you also call us to be saints. You say that we've been set apart as holy and you invite us to become holy. Lord, would you lead us as our Lord, as our King? Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.